there's not that many people in the world who have gone through the education cycle of understanding what is Bitcoin mm -hmm. that come out of it and are critics. Mm -hmm. Most people are critics don't understand it. That's right. Or they're they're in the pockets of somebody. Yeah. Um, but most people, once they go through that education and understand what Bitcoin is, become very excited about it. I don't know anyone who's done the work of the deep dive that's not a proponent of Bitcoin. Yeah. I don't know a single person. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Perry and Boring, welcome to the What Is Money show. Thanks, Robert. Great to be here. So great to have you. Um, thank you for joining me in person in Miami. Uh, we just had Mr. Estes on, so it's been nice to have both of you join me today. Just by way of quick introduction, you are the founder and CEO of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. So... Maybe we could start with that, your Bitcoin origin story, how you discovered Bitcoin, and how you got into the line of work that you're currently in. Yeah, so I, I'm a native Floridian. I grew up in Central Florida, studied economics at the University of Florida. I was there during the financial crisis of 08. Okay. And uh, you know, Florida was hit pretty hard by the financial mm. collapse. Um, it, Everybody I knew was impacted in some way, shape, or form. You know, my parents um, lost a lot of their life savings because of mm -hmm. how the stock market collapsed. My you know, members of my family, their homes went underwater and they ended up having, to, they lost their homes. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still recovering from that to this day. Um, so I really wanted to understand, you know, why this was happening. Like, what, what is going on? And in school, you know, our professors, our textbooks were unable to answer, you know, these questions about what was happening in, in, in real time. And that led to, you know, of course, me asking a lot of questions because I'm very curious and I want to know why. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I, it led me to um, Dr. Ron Paul, who was running for president. Mm. And he was the only person out of all the, you know, PhD economic professors uh, that that were out there. None of them could answer the question, what's going on? But this guy who was running for president was able to explain it. And it all came down a lot to the, to the Fed. Mm. And I did my own personal study of, of what is money. Mm. And yeah, I learned about the Fed. 
I, I learned that it's actually not federal or much of a reserve. <laughs> I also learned about inflation and I felt like that was theft mm -hmm. and not right. I uh, also learned about the bailouts who got them who didn't. Mm. Learned about the banking system and how it works and how it's connected to Washington. And I felt like a lot of these things did not represent the values of the community that I was brought up in as an American. So I wanted to go to DC to fight for something better. Mm. So I went to DC. I was there my senior year of college. I went there as a, a White House intern, which was fascinating. And then I went to Capitol Hill and I worked on the Hill as an aide. And I was known for being this crazy libertarian in DC. Uh, most people that work on the Hill are either Democrats or Republicans. There's no real, there's not really like a libertarian party in all mm -hmm. of this. Um, and I was uh, a big fan girl of Congressman Ron Paul. And I went to all of his talks, all of his speeches. He used to give talks for the, mm -hmm. the congressional staff every so often. I went to every single one of them. Uh, made sure, you know, the member that I worked for would was a uh, su supporter of Audit the Fed. I was there the day Audit the Fed passed the House, which is very exciting. Um, so I was kind of known as this crazy libertarian on the Hill. And one of my friends said, hey, I, I found this thing called Bitcoin. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think you'd like it just because I know how crazy you are. And I was like, sure enough, uh, this virtual currency that wasn't created by the government that wasn't controlled by anybody. I was like, this is it. This is what mm. I've been looking for. It's not It's not a bill. It's not a policy. Mm. Uh, the way we solve these systemic issues is with this technology. So I ended up shifting my focus um, at you know, working in Bitcoin full time in 2013. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Wow. Early days. Very early days. That is so it's cool. Been, um, it's been a ride. That is so cool. So you, then Ron Paul was the guy that black-pilled you on libertarianism. <laughs> I joke uh, with my husband and I say, uh, Ron Paul will always be my first love. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't he all of ours? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, he was definitely my inspiration for, for going to D.C. to work yeah. in public policy. Uh, but he's, uh, who showed me all the great libertarian thinkers and authors. Yeah. Who you talk about on your show. Like yes. Jesus and Hayek and many others. Yeah. Uh, but it's really because of him that he brought, you know, this whole concept of the whole conversation of what is money. He yes. brought that into the American consciousness. Yes. Which is one of the things that was so amazing about him. I mean, he was, I think, in office for 24 years and he came to office to really work, at, you know, bring awareness to the Federal Reserve. I mean, people just thought he was a complete nut. Mm -hmm. People thought I was a nut because I liked him. Sure. So here to be here where we are today, where there's so many more people that fully understand you know, what money is and what it's not and yes. how it impacts our lives, how inflation impacts, how we can survive. Uh, I think it was really Dr. Paul who started that movement in the United States. I would love to hear if we could linger on that question for a minute, since it is the namesake of the show. And I often like to ask my guests about the nature of money. What, in your opinion, how do you define money? And then as a second question, part of that question, what light bulb moments did you have in going into the libertarianism rabbit hole? Like were there particular phrases or books or anything that really, really lit you up um, from any of the, the authors that we've discussed? Well, I know you're a big fan of Ayn Rand mm -hmm. uh, and I am too. A recent big fan, actually. I only have just read Atlas Shrugged, but yes, I think she's superb. So when I first started working on Capitol Hill, uh, there's a group called um, the Ayn Rand Society, and uh, they would host briefings for congressional staff. Uh, and I learned about this as you know, one of these crazy you know libertarians working on the Hill. Mm -hmm. And I had like perfect attendance at all their briefings, <laughs> and I got all these free books. And the first book that I was recommended to read when I went to D.C. was Atlas Shrugged. And that was mm -hmm. the first book I read when I got to the Hill. Awesome. Um, but, you know, to me, what it means to be an American is what it means to be free. Like, we're mm -hmm. here, so many people before us. And I think in our generation, it's so easy to not fully appreciate the struggle that it took for America to become America, mm -hmm. where we have freedom of choice, where we have freedom of religion, where we have freedom of speech. And I fully believe it's our job as Americans to protect that. Mm -hmm. That is our duty as Americans. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to fight. We didn't have to go to war, although there are wars going on right now. Sure. But most of us, you know, we'll never have to go through that right. type of struggle. Um, so I think Ayn Rand also 
did a really good job of explaining and you know in more of a novel format the difference between free enterprise and you know and socialism mm-hmm. and communism and and why uh, having free enterprise and, and free markets is absolutely essential and critical to, to freedom in general, which is why we're here in the United yes. States. Yeah, it's well said. Um, the the money speech uh, by Francisco Danconia in that book Atlas Shrugged, so good. I I'll share the story. I don't. I've shared it with others, but I'll share it with you. I was sitting in the National Airport. I had just returned from another trip. And I'd been listening to Atlas Shrugged. This was probably six months ago. I didn't read the book. I actually did the audio book instead. And as I'm sitting there waiting for the Uber to come, this guy walks right into the center of my vision. He's wearing a head-to-toe suit with dollar signs on it. So it's like a green suit with dollar signs, head-to-toe. People are like coming up to him, talking to him, you know, like, what's up with the suit or whatever. I'm sitting there looking at the guy. I take a picture of him. I'm going to post something on Twitter about it, you know, something smart-ass perhaps. And right at that moment, you know, the Atlas Shrugged audiobook is 64 hours long. Francisco Danconia's money speech begins, like a weird synchronicity. And I was like, huh. And so I listened to that speech and it was just such a brilliant description of the nature of money. I thought it was so good. I listened to it probably seven times in the next few days. I ended up doing a read for it on the channel and had my editor put some animations over it. And it went sort of viral, did like 300,000 views. But in terms of trying to describe money. I don't think anyone has done a better job than Ayn Rand in that that one excerpt. I, I think money is the lifeblood of an economy. Mm-hmm. And it's it's important for people to understand just how critical money is to be to be able to function as, mm-hmm. as, a, as a human in modern day society. You need money to pay rent. You need money to 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 eat, to buy food. You need money to facilitate you know, most transactions that we engage in day to day, if the money is not healthy, the economy can't function correctly. Exactly, and that's that's where we are today. You know, if 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 the blood within within the organism is is tainted, mm-hmm. you know, the organism is going to suffer from significant issues. Yes, and we see that we're facing significant systemic issues across the global financial system and it many of them can come down to the money yes the monetary system yeah i think it's a it's a wonderful analogy um blood circulates through the entirety of the organism if the blood is diseased then how can anything in the organism not suffer and going into the money rabbit hole you start to see how it literally infects or affects every Everything. aspect of life, like right? your mind, social cohesion, you know, it's, it contributes to warfare, all of these terrible things. And um, uh, yeah, I struggle to think of a, a domain of human experience that money doesn't touch. So if, if money is corrupted or, or diseased, then it makes, it stands to reason that all these other domains would also be corrupted or diseased. Um, what are you doing in, so obviously your work at the chamber this is a very big idea right um the the most desired asset in the world the u.s dollar is simultaneously the biggest scam in the world how do you communicate this idea in an effective way to hopefully get political leadership to awaken to this harsh reality well, for one, we we would not pent Bitcoin up against the U.S. dollar as an adversary mm-hmm. for a couple of strategic reasons. I, I don't. I feel like from a political perspective, it, it's not helpful to make an enemy. Bitcoin is still very young in NISA. We're still mm-hmm. a relatively unorganized community. I mean, we're we're starting to mature, but mm-hmm. it's still such early days. Um, the <laughs> the fiat system is very well organized, very well capitalized, uh, and, and that's not, that's not an enemy we want to create for mm-hmm. Bitcoin. At least t- today, mm-hmm. it's a little unnecessary. So um, we, we we don't it, with most policymakers that that would be a very difficult kind of sure. pill to swallow. Um, mm-hmm. It's either Bitcoin or the U.S. dollar. That's right. kind of a difficult position to put any policymaker in. 
Um, but our job at the Chamber of Digital Commerce is to make Bitcoin available to the people of the world. Mm. That's what we're focused on. And you know, we, we don't we don't necessarily want to get into um, you know, kind of the difference. I mean, we very much see that this technology is and should be uh, freedom of choice for people to use mm-hmm. for whatever reason. And our legal system today is not very accommodating to this technology. Uh, so we are working on breaking down the biggest barriers of adoption so this technology can go mainstream. Mm. So a couple of the things that we've done just recently, uh, one of the number one barriers to the corporate adoption of Bitcoin, so for companies, businesses that want to put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. So if you look at Michael Saylor, I know he's a very popular guest uh, from your show. Uh, you know, he's talked a lot about treasury management for businesses. So he had you know, a cash issue, a lot of cash at MicroStrategy, doesn't want to leave it in U.S. dollars because of inflation. If you just leave it, you know, mm-hmm. in in currency, you know, you know, it's going to get inflated mm-hmm. and devalue over time. So you don't want to leave all your money in, you know, denominated in U.S. dollars. So what do you put it in? And he discovered Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And he was really the first, re- you know, major public company to go down this exercise. Many other companies would like to follow uh, what MicroStrategy has done, uh, except for it's very punitive to put Bitcoin on the balance sheet because of the accounting rules. Mm. So there's there's an official board mm-hmm. called the FASB, mm-hmm. Financial Accounting Standards Board, and they set the rules for both public and private companies mm-hmm. on how you know, how your financial statements work. Mm-hmm. And they said that you know crypto assets. Uh, would be valued as intangibles, Mm -hmm. which are just very punitive because you have to mark it down every time Bitcoin goes down. But if Bitcoin goes up, you can't mark it up. So Mm -hmm. most CFOs or accountants would tell their, you know, advise their CFO or advise the CEO and say, you know, if you put Bitcoin on our company's balance sheet, it's going to go down because Bitcoin's volatile. Mm -hmm. It's going to bring the whole balance sheet down. And now that could be an argument that shareholders could say, you know, you've harmed the shareholders. So this is why most companies, particularly public companies today, are not putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet. So we spent five years petitioning the FASB. It took five years, but we got that done last year. Um, So that issue has been fixed. This is fair value accounting. So it has been changed to fair value accounting, but the rule doesn't go fully into effect until December of 2024. Okay. Um, So until it's mandated, most companies will, because most public companies are quite conservative, particularly with financial statements and how they handle them. Um, most We don't expect to see many more public companies put Bitcoin on the balance sheet till next year. Mm. But that was a, a critical issue, a cr- yeah. you know, critical opportunity. And we think that has an opportunity to bring a whole new group of stakeholders into our community. Mm. So that's one topic. Tax is another topic. Um, you know, Bitcoin is is taxed as as property. Right. We don't think Bitcoin should be taxed as property. People should be allowed to use it as currency. Right. That's a longer term battle because that's much difficult, more difficult to change. Petitioning the IRS, it's going to take an act of Congress. And so the IRS has to legally acknowledge Bitcoin as currency for that to go into effect. And they're not going to do that. Right. Unless we had a president in place who who would do that through executive order. Gotcha. Uh, we've tried yeah, <laughs> many yeah. times. So you either need to have a president in place who would do this through executive order or an act of Congress. Um, so that's a longer term policy goal for us is getting yeah. the taxes fixed for Bitcoin. So it's, yeah. you know, it makes more sense for people to buy it right. and invest and hold it. Um, and then we do a lot of defense. Uh, today we're very much in a defensive. Our community is in a defensive posture. You see this all over the news today. We're being attacked left and right, uh, and you've done you know a really good job, Robert, with your show, allowing people to come and talk about the value of Bitcoin. But you know, you. most uh, people in the media don't. Yeah. You know, you're definitely the exception, uh, and it's it's been quite frustrating. So, you know, we're very active with correcting the narratives, but particularly making sure the narrative in Washington is at least accurate Mm -hmm. because there's so much misinformation. So we do that with energy. We do that around Mm. the AML issues for Bitcoin. So we're we're doing a lot of defense today. 
I would imagine a lot of, you mentioned energy. Uh, I would imagine a lot of that defense is also centered around Bitcoin's environmental impact. Um, there is this general misconception that Bitcoin energy use is pure waste. It will boil the oceans, you know, all of these things that environmentalists like to hold on to. Um, and I, th this one's particularly problematic because I think it couldn't be further from the truth, actually, that Bitcoin's incentivizing us to use stranded energy sources to be more cost effective in our use of energy, um, to, to monetize energy sources that otherwise couldn't be used. Like in our episode earlier, we talked about central planning and how it leads to, uh, the production of excess energy capacity that basically there's no market for, but now Bitcoin can be a market buyer for that excess energy. How do you deal or how do you combat that narrative or that misconception? Uh, and then if I'm, please correct me why I'm wrong, if it's not a large misconception in your world. I know it absolutely is. There's a great meme that's currently floating around the internet right now. And it, it's like the guy with two buttons and one button says, <laughs> Bitcoin's backed by nothing. The other one's Bitcoin uses too much energy. Yeah. And it's like, you can't have it both ways, so uh, which is exactly right. <laughs> um, but the energy piece has been a big concern. About three years ago, uh, the, the team at the Chamber of Digital Commerce, we sat down and really started waving the flag of like this energy narrative is getting out of control. Uh -huh. When you start seeing Greenpeace and Sierra Club start attacking Bitcoin, uh, these are very, very large, uh, well-funded, well-organized, incredibly experienced uh, policy groups. Uh, so these are very significant adversaries for Bitcoin to have. And so we really rounded up a lot of the Bitcoin mining companies and said, we need to get organized as a community to fight this because because they're attacking us. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. And, you know, the community did an incredible job mm -hmm. um, ending the FUD. I love that term, end mm -hmm. the FUD, because uh, it, you know, goes back to my history of wanting to end <laughs> the Fed. But uh, it's now all about the fear and un uncertainty and doubt. And uh, a lot of great work has been done by our community. A lot of academics stepped in to refute a lot of the bad um, facts about mm -hmm. Bitcoin and energy usage. So about six months ago, uh, we felt like we pretty much accomplished what we sought out to do in our defensive energy strategy. Mm -hmm. um, today, I mean, it's still an issue, but you don't see the type of attacks uh, that we had seen previously. And the people who work in energy policy today have now been properly educated. And mm -hmm. we're not as concerned about energy as we were a year, two years ago. But we are still very involved in energy policy, but we are actually actively in an offensive strategy. So we've mm -hmm. been able to go from defense to offense on energy policy. So this is what we're doing at the Digital Power Network. This is an affiliate organization that we launched. Mm -hmm. uh, late last year and it, and it's it's a very uh strategic way to advocate for bitcoin so in working with all these bitcoin mining companies what we were seeing across the industry is i mean really incredible work we have we're representing companies that are involved in methane mitigation they're literally using bitcoin mining to remove carbon from the environment mm -hmm incredible narrative, cleaning up the environment mm. using Bitcoin mining. That That is happening today. And that was just on 60 Minutes, by the way. Mm. Um, Crusoe uh, was on was featured on 60 Minutes for this technology that they pioneered. Um, and there's many other companies doing methane mitigation across the Bitcoin community uh, today. Uh, we're also seeing that Bitcoin mining is the most uh, sustainable inter uh, uh, industry in the world. Mm. Uh, is energy, sustainable energy mix is over 60%. We have more than any other industry, you know, uh, ma major industry out there. Um, and because Bitcoin mining is using so much renewable energy, it's actually leading to further investments and mm. build out of renewable plants. So, um, you know, if you're aligned with a more sustainable energy future, mm -hmm. uh, you, you are aligned with, with Bitcoin. Mm. Um, we've also seen incredible work, particularly in Texas, where Bitcoin miners are official partners with grid operators, or caught in this mm. instance, uh, to stabilize and secure energy grids, mm. which is helping prevent blackouts, but you're protecting energy infrastructure. 
Uh, and we helped get the work that our members were doing in Texas with ERCOT into an official White House study by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, and then we're also seeing, due to this huge demand of Bitcoin mining in the United States, bringing back, or not bringing back, but bringing a semiconductor manufacturing to the United States, uh, which is a national security goal, mm -hmm. not just for Bitcoin, but for U.S. Mm -hmm. national security is doing chip manufacturing here in the United States. Bitcoin mining is helping drive investment mm -hmm. and demand into that. So if you take what all these different, all you know, you have many different Bitcoin mining companies whose technology are focused on a lot of different areas, whether that's methane mitigation, sustainability, uh, you know, you've got ones that are working with the grid operators, those doing manufacturing. You bring all of this together, and now we as an industry have an argument to put forward that Bitcoin mining is helping to advance and protect energy security in the United States. Mm. Bitcoin mining today, if you look at what these companies are doing, these Bitcoin mining tools are being integrated with traditional energy infrastructure. Mm. So what we're doing at the Digital Power Network is bringing all your traditional energy stakeholders in. So whether that's the nuclear industry, uh, power um, generation facilities, utility companies, operators, the regulators, the energy regulators, and helping them see these advancements that have been had, these technical advancements that are coming from Bitcoin companies. Uh, and I believe over time, we will have new advocates for Bitcoin. It was one thing for me and you to advocate for Bitcoin. Of course, sure. we're, we're, we're crazy about Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Like we're Bitcoin advocates. But if you can have energy stakeholders say, well, because we have this technology available to us, we're able to secure infrastructure. Yeah. That's a very different type of voice to have in the policy conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so this is our strategy on how we get national security and energy security advocates to be a part of the, the conversation in Washington to help advance Bitcoin and make it available to everybody. That's wonderful. So a lot of this is, I imagine, again, to correct me if I'm wrong, you're probably speaking to the pocketbooks of these energy producers, right? And that when we looked at some of the uh, renewable energy assets, for instance, they have, you know, the wind's blowing in the afternoon, there's a lot of excess energy production. They curtail some of that. They can't even use all of it. Then at night, when the homes need to be heated, they're actually not producing enough. So Bitcoin sort of acts as a load balancer in that respect. And the numbers that I saw in some of these analysis were like, you know, you could increase the revenue of these wind or solar units 5, 10, 15%, depending on the geography. Is that the the thrust when you're approaching these energy asset operators? It's like, look, you're leaving money on the table. Like, how do you how are you convincing them of the uh, the utility of Bitcoin? Well, there, from the renewable perspective, there's been a number of studies of investors, um, and and Kathy Woods, one of them, who came out and said, you know, we weren't really interested in the renewable industry at all as as mm. as an investor, uh, but when you put Bitcoin mining into the economic model of a renewable facility, mm -hmm. it changes the model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we actually may be open to investing in renewables. So because Bitcoin mining makes it much more economically possible to build renewable facilities, this is going to lead to more investments in mm -hmm. renewables. It's also going to lead to the build out of more renewables around the country and around the world. Yeah, it's a really big deal. And, um, the other thing I heard put forth that was compelling was oftentimes these energy uh, production facilities will come online before the distribution is there. So they don't actually have any market to sell it into. Right. But if some of their capacity is coming online before distribution, that you can actually just plug in Bitcoin mining and start financially bootstrapping the operation before there's ever distribution. Yeah, I like to kind of look at it as like an, an anchor tenant. Yes. So if you're creating a, a big shopping mall... If you have a massive department store, the Bitcoin department mm. store that you, you know you know is going to take up X capacity, mm. uh, then then that can help jumpstart, right? You know, building a new facility. Yes, a buyer that never stops buy. They're always there to sell to, basically, even if you can't right. sell and distribute the electricity. It's a good analogy. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers: thirty-six thousand, twenty-five, and one. 
36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Okay, so that's good. You're working to win some Bitcoin proponents and advocates on our side, and we do need more than just crazy libertarians, I think, supporting Bitcoin to really get the message across. So that's all good work, especially considering we're facing some pretty serious Bitcoin detractors, such as Elizabeth Warren and her war. Is it a war in Bitcoin now? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what is she doing in the political sphere to try and stop Bitcoin or stop people from using Bitcoin. Elizabeth Warren has introduced a bill called the Digital Asset Anti-Money Laundering Act, which would effectively ban Bitcoin and all cryptocurrencies. However, she has introduced this bill under what I would call false pretenses, and I think it's highly misleading. So if you listen to her and you listen to her speeches and the hearings and, and on the Senate floor, She's leading, this is a game of political theater. Let me just kind of start with this. It's all about political theater. Six months ago, when the House, pa- the, the committees passed these digital asset market structure bills that would have created the legal framework for the digital asset space, which would have been a huge boon to the economy, she s- stole the, the microphone and said, crypto has an AML problem. Um, So kind of misleading piece of theater number one, uh, she has led a lot of people in Washington to believe that Bitcoin and the whole crypto space uh, is a huge contributor to illicit finance. We know that's obviously incorrect because you can just look at the numbers. Yeah. Um, So people, but people think that because, you know, most people in Washington aren't cryptocurrency or blockchain Mm. experts, you know, and it it was in the Wall Street Journal, so it must be correct. Um, So she introduced this bill, which she is telling us um, Mm. that it closes a compliance problem. Mm. You know, it's a light touch, you know, compliance issue to make sure that cryptocurrencies are, uh, we have the same, you know, illicit finance protection for cryptocurrencies as we do in the banking system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she convinced about 20% of the Senate of this. So mm-hmm. the, the bill has 19 co-sponsors, there's 100 senators, so roughly 20% of the Senate is on record wanting to effectively ban cryptocurrency. Um We've met with every single one of these offices. Most of them were not aware that the bill actually would is a backdoor ban. Mm. Um, if you if you read the bill, it doesn't say we're banning crypto. Mm. It it amends the Bank Secrecy Act to define a bunch of different things in the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency space as financial institution, or they'd have to be regulated Mm. as a financial institution. One of those things is self-hosted wallets Mm. or unhosted wallets is the term they use. Bitcoin miners, also node validators. Um, Of course, a Bitcoin wallet, a self-hosted wallet, can't act as a financial institution. It's code. It just... It could be your brain, too. Are you going to ban brains? Are you going to... Yeah, I mean, (laughs) are, are you going to file... You know, regulatory reports with FinCEN over your personal wallet. Like, how would that work? If you're my, if you're a Bitcoin miner, um, you would have to collect all the personal information about every transaction that you're verifying in a block. Of course, you don't have that information. That information right. does not exist. Right. Which means you couldn't legally operate that business in the United States anymore. That's mm-hmm. why it, it's effectively a ban. It is a ban. Let's just call it mm-hmm. what it is. 
Um, so we're trying to bring awareness to this. And I think, uh, you know, some people in this space have are, are not either aware or just not concerned enough, but we should be incredibly concerned uh, because this bill has significant support mm-hmm. in the Senate and it's it, it, it could pass. It could yeah. become law. Wow. And this is completely unacceptable. And it's all under false pretenses. Right. What can, I mean, what is the action you are recommending from people to try and push back against the passing of this bill? Well, I mean, a number of things. We, we do have a petition. If you go on our um, website or our Twitter page, you can go to at Digital Chamber. You can sign our petition um, to try to stop the bill. You can you know, ca- obviously call your congressman, write letters. More importantly, don't vote for these people. Right. You just participate in the political process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we as a community need to send a strong message to Washington that we do not want Washington to try to ban cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. I think we can win this one. Mm-hmm. I do because I believe most of the members who are on this bill don't, you know, didn't fully understand what they were getting themselves into. Mm-hmm. This is Elizabeth Warren. She's the enemy, not the other 18 members. Um, I think if we can make a big enough deal that, that you know, one, Elizabeth Warren misled everybody to, we don't want this. We, we, we want to have the right to have access to crypto and mm-hmm. hold it ourselves in the United States. Then I think those 18 members will be less likely to ever want to do business with Elizabeth Warren t- again. Mm. And we, we are confident this bill would not become law in this Congress. Um, we have a blockade that I can confirm is in place in the U.S. House of Representatives. But I can't confirm that blockade would would still be there after this election because mm. the Congress changes every two years. Right. So depending on who is in what seat, you know, could there be a, a pathway for this bill to pass? It, it's possible. So we need to nip this in the bud this year because we don't know if we'll be able to block it in a future Congress. And I think we can do that by sending a clear message that cryptocurrencies are here to here to stay mm-hmm. and do not block blocker access to them. Yeah, it's it seems kind of ridiculous, I think, when you understand the nature of Bitcoin that it is just code, it is just speech to yeah. try and block it. I mean that's what the unhosted wallet thing, right? Like your brain can actually be an unhosted wallet. So how are you gonna it just doesn't well, I don't think the enforceability is there, and it sounds like she's also trying to backdoor this ban where it's not being explicitly written into the bill. It's just implied. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, how you would enforce this is very questionable, um, and that's why there's a number of members who are opposed to it because they fully understand that, mm-hmm. um, but you know, this is the What is Money show, so let's talk a little bit about monetary history. Uh, you know, it wasn't really that long ago that, you know, the Congress passed a law saying it was illegal to own gold. Yeah. And you had to turn all, all your gold into the Fed. 1933, I think. And I, the bill was, well, there was an executive order in 33, and then they Congress officially passed a bill in 34. And it, you know, anyone with, with gold had to um, exchange it. So, and they got like 20 bucks for it, 20 mm-hmm. bucks and some, some change. So, I mean, we, we've seen, you know, total nationalization of, of money before. Mm-hmm. Back then we were on a gold standard. So mm-hmm. gold was money at that time. We've seen total confiscation. So I, I don't think we want to underestimate, you know, the power of the government. Sure. And, you know, our, our nation was founded on principles of, of limited government. And again, it's our job as the people to protect our rights yeah. because no one else is. And the government's always trying to expand its jurisdiction. Right. So we have to push back yes. because we have everything to lose. Yes, that's, that's an excellent point. What, in, in your estimation, and perhaps the chamber has figured some of this out. What is Warren's motivation with trying to pass this bill? Is this a special interest that's speaking through her? How do you see that? So there's two sides. Um, we did make it known publicly that the bill uh, was purportedly written by a bank lobby group. Mm-hmm. So Senator Roger Marshall, he's the Republican lead sponsor of the bill. So you have Elizabeth Warren, she's the lead Democrat sponsor. Senator Marshall is the lead 
Republican sponsored. So they introduce as a bipartisan bill. When they do that, mm -hmm. when it's a, a bipartisan bill, it makes it look more appealing. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood of more people getting on, it's going to be higher. So Roger Marshall gave a, a, a talk at a private event um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and one of the members of my team was at this event. And Roger Marshall um, talked about this bill. Um, and he said some very interesting things about it. And uh, we asked the organizer of that event if we could have the, the clip because we had a great interest in the bill. And mm -hmm. the, the, the senator graciously gave it to us. So it's now up. It's on our, our, our Twitter page. But Roger Marshall s said that it's a light touch bill, which it's not. It's a ban. He also said that it was written by the American Bankers Association, that we set that on record. And then he also said, you know, that's all I know about crypto. He, he didn't really understand the issue. He also <laughs> forgot the name of his own bill. So um, <laughs> we do know the banks. I mean, according to Roger Marshall and what he said at this event, he said, you know, the American Bankers Association yeah. wrote it. So, you know, the, the, it sounds like the banks are behind it. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I think kind of the other side is Elizabeth Warren wants to bring forward central bank digital currency. Mm -hmm, so, you know, Bitcoin is incongruent with a, 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 a Fed coin. Mm -hmm. And so I think she wants to nip this in the bud. She wants to nip crypto and Bitcoin in the bud while we're still like a young and a relatively immature and an organized mm -hmm. community. Not to, you know, I, I love our community, but we're nothing like sure. the banking industry or oh. the energy industry, you know, much bigger, we, a lot more money, a lot more experience doing this stuff. So I think she's thinking, and I think a lot of the members on the bill think, well, crypt, like no one cares about crypto, we, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. we, we, can, we can sneak this one through. No mm -hmm. one's, no one's going to even notice because, right. you know, crypto and, you know, they're all thinking about FTX sure. and all that, uh, SBF garbage, everyone, you know, a lot of crazy that's happened in D.C. in the past year with the crypto space. Mm. So I think this is, you know, a part of a, a plan to bring forth a CBDC in the United States. Or so. Which, you know, obviously um, would be very problematic to, you know, freedom and yeah. prosperity for, for all. Yeah, probably the biggest problem we would ever face in our lives in terms of freedom at least in the West, would be the implementation of a CBDC. It's very scary. So several years ago, uh, we actually did a pretty big study of China's digital yuan. Um, and this was before it launched. Uh, but I read a couple news articles saying they're working on, on a CBDC and, you know, there's all these patent applications on it. So um, we, we work with a number of IP attorneys. We, we work with many tech companies, small and very large you know, many of them have their own IP counsel. So I, you know, I talked to these guys, some of the best IP counsel in the country saying, hey, you know, have you seen these patent applications? Mm -hmm. Apparently, China has a whole bunch on a, a CBDC. Mm -hmm. Nobody could find them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was insane. Um, so we ended up having to like recruit uh, uh, a student at Tsinghua University on the ground in China to go find them. And they did. They were obscured under diff weird names. Um, and the patent applications in China are supposed to be available in English as mm -hmm. well as Mandarin. They, they weren't. They were only written in Mandarin. So we were able to find 123 of the original patents by the PBOC. Uh, we translated them into English and made them available to the West for the first time. And this spurred three hearings in the Senate. Mm. Um, but we were one of the first people to read the PBOC's patents on their CBDC. And what I can tell you is that it's incredibly scary. It's mm. full surveillance. Yeah. It is complete control over the financial system. And I, I believe that's incongruent with um, America's um, principles. Absolutely. I mean, almost by definition, digital totalitarianism, right? To have total visibility and control over everyone's economic livelihood. And as you said earlier, the economic lifeblood yeah. to be centrally planned and controlled in that way. I mean, that's as, as bad as it can get. And in China, it's, um, you know, China think they plan in 100 year timelines here in the United States. We, we can only plan in four year timelines. 
Um, so they're you know a lot more strategic than than we are. So we have to you know outsmart them. But uh, you know I'm not sure that we are doing that right now as a country. But they have a social credit scoring program. Yeah. So you know if you jaywalk, yeah, you know, you'll 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 get a you'll get a little nick on your score. They also have the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a supply chain initiative. Uh, you know, Ch- China's obviously a, a massive manufacturer of, you know, everything, and they want to export their goods to everybody. So if you take social credit social credit, plus Belt and Road plus a CBDC, it's, it's not just control of the money. It's mm-hmm. control of everything. Right. And they'll use Belt and Road to export the digital yuan around the world, and they'll use social credit to manipulate everyone's behavior. So... It's it's a, it's a technology to control a population. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. It's a digital panopticon almost. It's, it, uh, yeah. Writing. Wow. Very scary. That's why what we do to make sure Bitcoin is available to the people of the world is so important. Yes. We, we need an alternative. Absolutely. So what is then, and this is why pushing back against Senator Warren's anti-Bitcoin, anti-crypto campaign is so important because that is a Trojan horse for CBDC, right? We're fighting for our future. Yeah. And, you know. What, what is the Stop Crypto Ban campaign? Well, that's our campaign to stop this bill. Okay. For all these reasons that yeah. that we've been discussing. But you should you should care whether, you know, you, you're into Bitcoin or you're not. Because once a government bans an entire industry, where does it stop? Mm-hmm. What kind of precedent does that set? Right. What's next? So, and if you, th- you know, again, come back to this, you know, example of, of China, mm-hmm. um, you know, what if, you know, the person in power who controls this money system, you know, what if they, what, what if they're not aligned with the LGBTQ community? Mm-hmm. What if you buy or attend, you know, a, you know buy a pamphlet or attend an LGBTQ event? The government sees that they're not aligned with that. Mm-hmm. Can they put right. you out of the system? Make it impossible for you to pay your rent or survive? Or what if the the you know the government in charge is not aligned with you know with something else that you're in? Yeah. So it's this isn't a fight about Bitcoin. The bill is right. a is a is a crypto digital asset bill, but it it's much bigger than that. It's a fight for human freedom. Right, like it doesn't matter what group affiliation you claim or religious affiliation or rate. Like, if you cede that power to one centralized entity, then it's game over for human freedom. So it's not. Uh, this is why I get bothered when people, you know, oftentimes people will advocate for censorship as long as it's not them being censored. It's someone that they disagree with. Like, oh, it's okay then. Right. But that's not, I mean, again, this is what, this is fundamental to free speech, right? My, it's free, like a principled approach, right? Because we yes. draw the line. Free speech necessarily means that I have to be willing to listen to opinions that I don't agree with, right? I can't selectively say, oh, I don't want to hear those or those, just the ones I agree with. That's not free speech. Right. So the same thing's true with money, right? It's you can't selectively say this group can't transact, that group can't transact as long as I can transact. Right. Once that weapon is there, it's going to be used against you at some point. Right. It's just a matter of time. Right. So it's a matter of, I guess, preventing that weapon from coming to be in the first place. That's so important. And protecting our, our freedoms. Yes. Yes, exactly. You, you said there's a Wall Street Journal article um, and a response that I guess the, the chamber made as an example of combating misinformation surrounding Bitcoin. Is this, it, this pertains to... So if, if you, rem- bill? yeah, if you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, there was an article published in the Wall Street Journal, and uh, it was about the October 7th uh, terrorist attack mm-hmm. in Israel. And if you read the article, you would have been led to believe that the attack was fully funded by cryptocurrency mm-hmm. in Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole community was pretty upset about this and went into a frenzy. Uh, we submitted an official correction request to the Wall Street Journal hmm. saying, you know, this is this is incorrect. You have 
you can't lead the public to believe that yeah. the attacks were fully funded by the, the cryptocurrency space. Y and you left out some critical details. I mean, one of the one of the most important pieces of the story the Wall Street Journal left out is that Hamas actually put out a statement in April of last year announcing it will no longer accept donations in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in order to protect the identity of their donors. Mm. Like they ceased accepting them. Mm. So uh, was there money given to Hamas and cryptocurrency? Yes, but it was a, a very, very, very small amount mm. and they stopped taking it mm -hmm. because, you know, you can't conceal your tracks on a blockchain, right. you know? So, I mean, it's just fundamental to how the technology works. So we submitted a um, correction request. They did correct the article. Um, and they actually published our correction request as a letter to the editor, but they removed half of what I wrote. Instead of saying mm. your article is misleading because this, this, and this, mm. it said, it just said this, this, and this. Mm. Um, so, I mean, at least we got the article corrected, but it almost didn't matter because Senator Warren used that Wall Street Journal article to get a whole bunch more co-sponsors of the bill. A, a whole Without set the correction. of new senators signed onto the bill, and they're still on the bill. Right. So it, this is, um, you know, this is why it's so important. Or that political theater you talked about. This is the political theater. So it's this is why it's so important to be a part of the conversation because if you're not a part of the part the conversation, or I guess the, this is kind of a dumb slogan people say in D.C., but like if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. You know, if you're not in the conversation, uh. it's going to be shaped around you, and it, you know, you may be carved out. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. That sort of echoes something I often say about money. Is like if you don't understand how the game is being played, you probably are the game being played. Or the, there's a social media one too. Like if you're not paying for the product, you like you are. You the are the product. product. Yeah. Yes, that applies to a lot of things we've yeah. seen recently. Um, what so is there a lobby or interest in? I know we're young and disorganized and immature as an industry, as a Bitcoin industry, but is there the possibility of a lobby pushing back against the banking lobby that's trying to outlaw these things? Do you see any possibility of that? I think at the end of the day, it's absolutely critical that we have laws in the books or defend, well, probably more importantly that we defend ourselves against bad laws mm -hmm. like Senator Elizabeth Warren's mm -hmm. um, crypto ban bill. Right. And I don't necessarily think we have to fight the banks. The, the bill, I mean, while Senator Marshall did say that the American Bankers Association wrote, wrote the bill, um, I, we have a job and a duty as you know, part of the Bitcoin community to stand up and say, no, we don't agree with this. No. And it, it's a it's a bad bill at the end of the day. So it's fighting and defending ourselves to ensure we're not, you know, we have the right to exist. Mm -hmm. We have every right to do that. And we don't have to create necessarily a big fight with the banks to do that. But, you know, if <laughs> I think, you know, Jamie Dimon's kind of, made it pretty clear his yeah. position and we're making <laughs> ours clear as well. I love the memes going around about Jamie Dimon right now that he's been renamed on Bitcoin Twitter to Jeffrey Epstein's attorney. I'm sorry, F J Jeffrey Epstein's banker. Oh yeah, I did see <laughs> Jack Mahler's interview yes. this week. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, again, it's the political theater. Uh, yeah. You know, Jamie Dimon has also perpetuated this narrative that, you know, Bitcoin, its only use case is for illicit, uh, you know, illicit use yeah. cases. But at the, you know, at the same time, you know, the, the banking industry has, the mass majority of illicit finance goes through the banking industry, yeah. mass majority of it. So yeah. it's, yeah, it is, it is a lot of theater and this is why we got to be a part of the conversation. Yeah. And then there's the deeper point that central banking itself is probably the largest, largest organized crime syndicate in the history of humankind. <laughs> That never seems to get talked about very much. Um, yeah, and I, I guess, sorry, one more thing. I get really bothered by that entire point 
where they say, oh, these bad guys are using Bitcoin, hence we need to ban Bitcoin. Yeah. It's like, well, those quote unquote bad guys, which first of all, I don't know that I agree with that, depending on the, the context, they probably also wear clothes and drive cars and use knives and guns and speak English. They're like, the oxygen. They're breathing. They're breathing. Like, like what, this <laughs> whole idea of regulating everything like, just doesn't make sense. It's, yeah, what, what do they say? That it, it's not um, a gun that kills someone. It's the gunman, the gunman, right? Yeah, absolutely. The shooter. Absolutely. Yeah. So this idea of trying to ban the tool, like it's not going to stop the, the activity. It, it doesn't follow any type of policy logic at all. Yes. Right. You you regulate it. Right. Which it is. That That's another big fallacy about this bill is, you know, a lot of, again, a lot of the senators that we talked to that signed on, they're like, well, you know, crypto is unregulated. We're like, no, it's, it's very regulated. Mm-hmm. The places where you go to buy and sell crypto, mm-hmm. they are registered with the U.S. Treasury Department right. <laughs> as money service businesses. Yeah. They're regulated and they're subjected to the uh, the to the Bank Secrecy Act. Yeah, you know the same rules the banks have to follow. Yeah, so it's it it, it it's theater. It's a lot of misinformation. It's a lot of disinformation, and we're correcting the record. Yeah, and we're just talking about giving people choice, which is the other thing here. It's you know. CBDC is trying to take away choice, right? Like you're forced into this system. You have to do it this way. Whereas Bitcoin is just like, just do whatever you want, but here's an option that is actually favors your self-interest. You're not forced. No one's ever going to force you to use Bitcoin. I mean, presumably, maybe sometime somewhere, but it's, it's an open use, system. Yeah, they forced me. When I went to the Bitcoin conference in Amsterdam, <laughs> they, they forced me to give away some of my Bitcoin for a t-shirt oh, and yeah. take my fiat, but I wanted to, you know, hodl. Yeah. So yeah, I was forced in that. Instance. But you consented to the exchange. It's like, I mm-hmm. did. I did okay. take the shirt and I yeah. wear it and I like it. Right. So there you go. It's again, if you just look at it through the lens of human freedom, it's about creating more choices for people, not fewer. And I think that really clarifies what a lot of these political pushes are about. They're always about taking away people's choices rather than giving them more. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, I, you know, I like to say a healthy economy is going to have many different options because mm-hmm. many different people or many different um, actors in, in an economy have a very diverse set of needs. Yes. And so you should have, you know, in a free society, you should be able to use whatever you want. Of course. In exchange for your goods, your services, your your labor. Yeah. And if you if you want to use a a shiny rock, mm-hmm. use a shiny rock. Sure. You want to use a, a government um, piece of paper, use the government's paper. If you want to use Bitcoin, you should be able to use Bitcoin. But you should have you should have lots of options, yes. and that's how a healthy and thriving econ- economy works. I mean, if you look at you know other industries, you know think about food. Think about the huge diverse set of food options we have. Mm-hmm. You know, why don't we have you know when you have a, a monopoly or an oligopoly, mm. it it's, it, it is damaging to the health of an economy. Yes. Yeah, I get what freedom's like a very deep philosophical idea. It has a lot of different meanings. But one big component of it is optionality, right? How many, options. how many options yeah. do you have? So when you're constricting options, it's almost synonymous with destroying human freedom or constricting human freedom. And so... I, and it, you have to have government intervention for that as well. Exactly. So... There's a moral high ground, I guess, is what I'm getting at with Bitcoiners. Is like they're just trying to give people more options. No one's trying to force anything down your throat. No one's telling you to buy Bitcoin. We often say study Bitcoin or study the nature of money, and you might awaken to these realities of your options being taken away. But it's often these bills, like Senator Warren's, that are actually taking or trying to take away people's options. And that's the problem. It's wrong. So great stuff. Tell me about. DC Blockchain Summit 2024. What is that? When is that? And what is the purpose of that event? That's our conference. So we host an event every year in DC called the DC Blockchain Summit. We've been doing this for eight years now. Um, Our theme this year is shaping the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, So last year was a really hard year to have a a Bitcoin or crypto event in DC because Mm -hmm. After uh, you know, SBF imploded or a- 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 FTX imploded, and 
everybody else, everyone found out that they accepted, you know, essentially stolen money from Sam. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody wanted to, to be around <laughs> crypto he, people anymore. He contributed like a hundred million dollars. I think, I think so, it was forty million, is what was reported. Yeah. But I mean, there could have been more. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there was a lot that wasn't report. I mean, who knows? Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, millions and millions of millions of dollars of, you know, essentially what was probably stolen customer funds mm -hmm. was all given to like political donations and everybody <laughs> took it. Um, so uh, that wasn't great. So, you know, last year we were really focused on helping rebuild trust with with policymakers. Like, yeah, there there was a bad actor, um, but this was fraud. This wasn't like a crypto Right. Uh, a crypto fraud. This was just fraud. You know, this yeah. this, this happens and in, in, this could happen in any industry. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, if we had the laws in place here so companies could, could build yeah. here, it would be less likely that Americans would be using offshore exactly. uh, businesses to transact in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. So we're focused on shaping the future. We're really talking, we're talking about the, the, the future of technology and, and the future of money. Um, but we're going to have uh, many different policymakers come mm -hmm. that who are champions. Uh, every year we have you know many different champions throughout government who who will come and use this as a platform to share how they're helping advance uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, we'll have uh, Patrick McHenry there uh, this year. He's the chairman of the Financial Services Committee. He's actually outgoing. He's going to retire at the end of this year. So this will be, you know, one of his final appearances. Uh, but he did an amazing, an amazing job getting, you know, moving forward the the legislation for the cryptocurrency and in, in the Bitcoin space. Um, and we'll have the community there. Um, but this is really our opportunity as an industry to show DC that we are mature, that we are organized. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the vision that we all share, because a lot of people in Washington, you know, they read the Wall Street Journal article and, you know, they they probably don't have the same view that you and I do. So we want to bring the community into town um, so our policymakers can can meet the amazing people throughout this space, learn about the, uh, the, the applications that are being built, and also share stories about how this technology is, is helping communities around the country. Mm. Um, so this is a really positive day for, for our community. And, you know, we'd love for you to be there and, you know, for the rest of the industry to join us as well. Sounds like a, a great, great time and uh, much needed. I, uh, so I have a question about DC. I haven't spent much time there. I'll actually be there at the end of this month giving, speaking at an event, Liberty Con. There's this bad reputation about politicians that, you know, they're all just crooked. Yeah. Being in DC for a few years, as you have been, are there people there that are actually principled, like we're, we're that are, I guess you might say true red blooded Americans that actually believe in what this country was founded upon and they're there doing it for the right reasons? Because it seems to me if we could reach them with the Bitcoin message, like Bitcoin positively embodies the ethos that America was founded upon, right? Like, life, liberty, property, decentralized governance, all of these things. Is there an opportunity to maybe connect those dots with some of these people, if assuming they're there? Um, <laughs> there absolutely really are. There, there absolutely are. I mean, you know, the, these reputations are, are well earned. Um, there's, you know, a lot of politicians in DC that have no respect for it all. Mm. Um, and that's kind of the reality of our political system. I'm also uh, an, a big advocate of full political reform. I think mm -hmm. we need complete political reform. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many. Yeah, I, 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 I like to say the majority of the people in, in elected office are there for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. I do think a number of people are, have been there um, well past their welcome. Mm -hmm. it's, it's time for term limits. It's time for them to go. If you've never held a real job in society and you don't understand what it's like to be an American, you know, and have a job in this country, you know, doing normal things besides being a politician. You shouldn't be in office because how can you represent the people if you don't, right, yeah. you haven't walked in their shoes? Um, but there's ma there's many great uh, members out there who are aligned to our community, um, and th that's a big part of our job at the Chamber of Digital Commerce, and that's you know a big part of my job is being on the ground 
meeting with these people and hoping they'll give you the time just to to, to learn mm. about what Bitcoin is. And if you can convince them to give you a little bit of their time mm. and you build that trust with them. Yeah, there's not that many people in the world who have gone through the education cycle of understanding what is Bitcoin mm -hmm. that come out of it and are critics. Mm -hmm. Most people are critics don't understand it. That's right. Or they're they're in the pockets of somebody. Yeah. Um, but most people, once they go through that education and understand what Bitcoin is, become very excited about it. I don't know anyone who's done the work of the deep dive that's not a proponent of Bitcoin. Yeah. I don't know a single person. So there's many members who are champions of our space. Um, Congressman Warren Davidson from Ohio, he has a bill called Keep Your Coins Act mm -hmm. to you know put in law and preserve forever the right to self-custody. Uh, Congressman uh, Tom Emmer has been a, a massive champion of our space. He's currently the majority whip. He's a very senior member of, of the House. Mm -hmm. Um, has written and sponsored many pro Bitcoin and digital asset bills. Cynthia Lummis is, mm -hmm. you know, a Bitcoin maxi. She's got her partner, um, Senator Gillibrand, who's worked on her with the, the uh, Lummis Gillibrand Act. Uh, Ro Khanna, uh, a Democrat member who's been um, very supportive of our space. Darren Soto, um, mm -hmm. who's from Florida, another Democrat. Um, also very supportive. So there are many, you know, many champions uh, and we're trying to meet new ones every day. Mm, that's encouraging to hear. Um, okay, we, we got to talk about Bitcoin spot ETF because that is the biggest thing in the news yeah. in the past few weeks. Um, you did some work, I guess, behind the scenes. You guys contributed to this approval process. So I'll just leave it as an open question. Like, what what got this the spot Bitcoin ETF across the finish line? So we've been interested in spot Bitcoin ETFs for a long time. Um, I mean, I, I've been in the industry personally, you know, for uh, over ten years now. So the the first application was filed in 2013 by the Winkle Boss, and it, mm. it that didn't go through, obviously. But then there. It took, you know, over 10 years. There was, I think, 17 companies mm -hmm. that filed for spot Bitcoin ETFs over a 10-year period, and none of them were able to get them across the finish line. So a couple of years ago, we said, you know, what, what is, like, what is the deal? Mm -hmm. um, so we did a pretty big deep dive, um, and we um, probably did what I, I, I believe is the largest study on the spot Bitcoin ETF process. We looked at every single application ever filed. What was in it? Why was it rejected? Or you know, why you know, what did the SEC say? And then um, what we documented, and this was in just a very a fact based, you know, academic format. Mm -hmm. We weren't looking, you know, this wasn't like an opinion based research project. It's you know, what was applied? What? Why did the SEC reject it? When they reapplied, or when a new company applied again, did they address the issue? Mm -hmm. Yes, they all did. And then you, what we see is the SEC kept moving the goalpost of what is the requirement to bring a commodity ETF to market. Mm -hmm. And what we were also able to demonstrate through this research is that the SEC was discriminating against Bitcoin as an asset class mm -hmm. because no other commodity ETF was being held to this standard. Mm -hmm. And we also were able to demonstrate how the SEC was acting arbitrary and capricious towards spot Bitcoin ETF applicants. Mm. So our report that we put out was very damning to the SEC because we're a nonprofit. We're not applying mm. for a spot Bitcoin mm. ETF. We have really no skin in the game other than, yeah, you know, we want to make Bitcoin accessible to the people of the world. And mm. this is another product to make Bitcoin available in a new format mm. to a different set of people in the world. Um, so one of the issuers, of course, that was Grayscale ultimately sued the SEC and our, our report uh, played a, a big role in a lot of the legal research that went into Grayscale's case. And mm. you know, we were involved through an amicus brief and the SEC was found guilty mm. of being arbitrary and capricious, which is exactly what we said in our report. Um, and that's ultimately what paved the way, but we put a lot of political pressure on the SEC as well. Mm. So we took that report to every single member of Congress, all 535 members of Congress. Wow. 
We did multiple briefings for the Senate Banking Committee and the Financial Services Committee on the House. Those are the committees that have jurisdiction over the SEC. So they have oversight authority over the SEC. So the SEC is brought in for hearings. They also have, you know, subpoena authority and can have them testify under oath. So there's an oversight function that Congress plays over the agencies. We did a lot of work behind the scenes that nobody would ever see, but helping prep the members of Congress for those conversations in their role um, and helping uh, them bring to light um, a lot of information on the record about how the SEC was handling spot Bitcoin ETF Mm -hmm. applications. Um, There was, is it Senator... Tell us, Senator, in the um, Senate Banking Committee, there was a hearing over two years ago. And, um, you know, we helped the members prep for this, you know, it, and really grilled Gary Gensler mm-hmm. on, you know, what, what is it going to take ultimately to bring a spot Bitcoin ETF to market? And he, he, he said, well, you, I, I want to have control over the Bitcoin exchanges. So um, the Wall Street Journal wrote an article after that. The, the Wall Street Journal editorial board wrote an article saying that the SEC is holding Bitcoin hostage until it gets you know more jurisdiction, which, of course, that's government trying to expand its jurisdiction. So all of that was very damning to how the SEC was, was handling this. Um, but, you know, a lot of respect to Grayscale for actually suing. Mm-hmm. Uh, having to sue your regulator is never a good sure. position to be in. Sure. But they did. They were on the right side uh, side of the law, and we absolutely supported them through that entire process. And we're we're glad they did that. And now we have spot Bitcoin ETFs, and you know, and and now Bitcoin, you know, now Bitcoin is available to people who want to buy Bitcoin through the stock market. Wow, that's incredible. What do you think the what's beneath the was it arbitrary and capricious? You said this? arbitrary and capricious. What what's behind? What's motivating the SEC to take such an orientation? like that towards Bitcoin in your estimation? Well, you also have to understand that, I mean, we we all you know like to villainize Chairman Gensler and he deserves it, but uh, this started way before Chairman Gary Gensler. Mm. Um, before uh, President Biden, you know, President Trump was in office and uh, Chairman Jay Clayton was just as bad as, mm. as, as Chairman Gensler on this issue. He blocked spot Bitcoin ETFs and, you know, every commissioner over 10, uh, over chairman, Mm -hmm. chairman over a 10 year history blocked them. So it's, uh, it's hard to know exactly why exactly Uh, their reasoning is because they, they felt like there would be market manipulation and they didn't want to approve a product Mm -hmm. uh, where there's manipulation and in the underlying markets. Um, I think a piece of it is the right, I mean, Bitcoin is such a, an anomaly, uh, you know, of a, of a, an asset to introduce to the market. You know, it's very, it's not well understood at all. And I, I think for a regulator to approve a product, you know, to make Bitcoin available mm-hmm. at this scale, um, is like career risk or something. It's a little bit of a career risk because what if something goes wrong, you know, yeah. like you don't really understand it that well. What if something goes wrong now, you know, now you have egg on your face because you were the one that, that brought it to market. I, I think that ultimately mm-hmm. is probably um, the most intimidating part for, for regulators, mm-hmm. you know, making, you know, getting the laws ready and approving products and, mm-hmm. you know, making the technology accessible to the world. Uh, but there could be more, yeah. you know, but I think ultimately a lot of it is it, it's education at the end of the day. Yeah, fair enough. It's a big idea and it takes a long time to permeate into people's minds. One last personal question. We'll let you get out of here. What has this whole journey meant to you? Um, you said you were kind of black pilled by Ron Paul into libertarianism. Then you discovered the ultimate libertarian technology that is Bitcoin. And now it is seen, seems to be a central pillar to your entire professional life. Uh, what has this journey meant to you? Well, this has been my life, at least for the past 10 years. Um, I mean, to me, if I could sum it up in one word, it's it's about freedom. Mm. And I'm, I'm a mission-driven person. And I think 
our monetary system and our financial system has systemic issues. And I, I've, I've personally seen how that can impact people and families. I'm very fortunate. You know, I grew up in a middle class family. I've never been hungry. I've never been homeless. I've always been provided for. Um, but not everyone can can see that. And if we're not able to address these systemic issues in our financial system, um, you know, the future, you know, that, that freedom and that future won't be available to all. So, you know, to me, it's about giving people, this is freedom technology. And you should have the right to, we're, we're moving from the analog world to the digital world. We're still in that transition. And we shouldn't have to give up our rights and our freedoms in that transition to everything being digital, the advent mm -hmm. of the internet, all, everything you know, really happening online now. Uh, and that's what's been at risk. And I think we have lost a lot of our freedoms to the transition of, of, of going online, going digital. And this is, this is a technology to help us preserve those freedoms. Mm. Well said. Um, Perianne, thank you so much Thanks for, for defending human freedom, doing what you do. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So my handle is at Perianne DC and um, the chamber is at Digital Chamber. Awesome. We'll link to that in the show notes. Thank you so much again for doing this. Thanks, Robert.